Hello everyone. In today's video, we're going to talk about some general tips and tricks that you can use when you're designing many different types of figures. So the course philosophy here is really to focus on concepts for what makes an effective figure, not to focus on code or software or how to produce those figures. And the reason is knowing what makes an effective figure is most important. Once you know that, you can figure out how to do that using whatever visualization software you are most comfortable with. But until you know what makes a good figure, knowing all of the details of how to use a particular software package is not going to be particularly valuable to you. I think it's really important that when we're talking about a course like Reproducibility Teach, where we're looking at ways to make our research more transparent, more rigorous, and more reproducible, we spend some time thinking about why data visualization belongs in this type of a course. And I would argue that the reason for that is that data presentation is the foundation of our collective scientific knowledge. So in most papers, we're going to use figures to show the most important findings of our paper. These are the things that we really want readers to pay attention to and the messages we want readers to take away from our paper. And most often, the data underlying those figures are not available to readers. And even when data are available, they may not be available in any usable form. And furthermore, the availability of data declines rapidly with the time since publication. So that means that there really is no additional information beyond the figures that are in our paper for these key data points. And if we as scientists are systematically making poor choices about the types of figures that we use, if we're using figures that conceal the data or hide information or are potentially misleading for readers, then that has an impact on others' ability to interpret and understand and reuse our data, not just now, but also in the future. And no one wants to be responsible for ruining the future. So that's why it's really important that we talk about data visualization as part of this course. Okay, there are two common but incorrect assumptions that scientists tend to make when they are visualizing their data. The first is that readers read the paper in the order that it was written and designed to be read. So you might assume that readers start off with the title and abstract, then they read the introduction and the methods, and they're already into the results section before they even take a look at the figures. The second assumption that people make is that if they can interpret the figure, then their readers can also interpret the figure. Both of these assumptions are often incorrect, and we'll talk about why and what that means for how you design your figures. So we know from anecdotal reports that many scientists, editors, and reviewers actually look at our figures first, right after they look at the title and abstract. So often scientists, reviewers, and editors report that they go directly to the figures to get a sense of what the key important findings from the paper are. And if they're interested in those findings, they will go on to read the other parts of the paper. We also know that search engines and journal websites often allow readers to um, examine the figures along with the title and abstract. So for example, PubMed has a function that allows you to see the figures right below the title and abstract before you even click on the link to the paper, which means that people are seeing the figures potentially before they've read the introduction and methods section. And then we also know that scientists often share their figures on posters and in social media as well as in talks. And here, readers may have relatively little additional context um, beyond what, whatever the prior slides were in your talk or whatever information was presented prior to that on your poster. If it's on social media, they may simply be seeing the figure alone with a short description in the caption. So what can we take away from this? Well, the other thing that's important to remember is that we want to design our figures for a broad audience. So your readers don't just include experts in your field who are working on the same topics that you are. They may also include scientists from related fields. They may include scientists who are approaching your problem but using very different methods or from a very different perspective. They might include reviewers and editors, patients, educators, as well as grants officers for your funding agency. 
and things that are very clear to you might be quite confusing to readers who have a different background or a different expertise. So we want to think about how we can design our figures for a broad audience so that many people can appreciate and understand the message of the figure um, and the paper and will find it easier to interact with and understand the work that we are sharing. So what do we want to remember here? We want to design figures for our audience, not for ourselves. So figures should be self-exclamatory. Um, again, your, your reader may see the figure on social media, in a poster, in a talk, or even right below the title in the abstract without much additional context. And so the more context that the reader needs to understand that figure, the less accessible it is to someone who is using the figure as a way of assessing whether the paper is something that they would like to read further. Okay, so let's look at an example to think about some of these concepts. And um, I asked you to think about, we have an image here, so I'll just ask you to think about how much information you might need to interpret this image. So the first version is what we commonly see in scientific papers. This is an electron microscopy image with no annotation. And so if you are a researcher who happens to work with electron microscopy of mouse pancreatic beta islet cells, then you may recognize this image and you may be able to determine what the structures that you're looking at are and what this information means. However, many of your readers probably are not. And so if you're someone like me, this image is really quite useless. I can see that on this electron microscopy image, but I'm not getting a lot of information about what's going on here. In the next version of the figure, we have provided a little bit of annotation to help orient the reader to key structures. So for example, the regions that represent the nucleus and the cytoplasm are labeled. There are some shading used to highlight the regions where the peripheral insulin secretory vesicles appear. And then there are also some arrows pointing out mitochondrion and where those structures are located within the cytoplasm. And this would be much more helpful to a reader who is not familiar with this type of image and methodology and tissue type um, and species type in terms of helping someone to get oriented to what this figure is showing and where the structures are that might help one to answer the research question. In the third case, panel C, um, we have excessive labels. So right now there are so many labels that they're in fact covering up the image and making it hard to see what's going on in the image. And we also have this legend below that is entirely black and white and in text. And that makes it very difficult to read because if I want to know, for example, what the blue shading represents, I have to read all the way down until I find the letters for blue shape. And then I can see that that is euchromatin and so on and so forth for every other structure. So not only do we have excessive labeling, we also have a legend that's not very informative or helpful and actually makes it quite difficult for us to interpret this image. Now, sometimes you might need this level of labeling to help a researcher under, or a reader understand your research question and see how the image answers that research question. So what do you do in this case? Well, here's the solution for complex labeling. So here we use a second copy of the image as its own legend. And we place a semi-transparent white shaded box over that legend image so that the labels stand out from the actual image itself a little bit more strongly than they would otherwise. In addition to that, we have replaced the black and white text legend with a legend that shows actual symbols. And this makes it a lot easier for readers to match by eye the shapes and the colors of the symbol that they're seeing so that they can very quickly determine what the different labels represent. Now, I'll notice that here the uh, legend is actually right below the figure itself. Many of you are probably used to putting your legends entirely as text and not next to the image themselves. This is not ideal for readers because it forces your reader to look back and forth between the image and the legend. It's particularly problematic for figures that have a very large number of panels, and sometimes we often will see the um, 
legends for these very large figures actually getting pushed onto the next page. So now your reader is flipping pages or scrolling back and forth between pages to find out what every item in the legend represents, and this is not ideal. So whenever we can, making the legend part of the figure itself so that it appears right below the annotated figure is a really helpful strategy for making it easier for readers to see what's going on. Okay, here's a second of example of a way that you might rethink your visualization to make it accessible to a broad audience. And here's a caveat here. Um, I will, the, the figure that I'm going to show presents odds ratios on a linear scale, there are some people who argue strongly that they should be presented on a log scale. So that's just something to be aware of. Okay, some of you may work with odds ratios and others of you may never have seen an odds ratio or maybe have heard of one once or twice but aren't really sure what they represent. So this is a figure that we might see in a paper that simply shows odd ratios for different groups and different anatomical types. And we have a statement about, or a label showing what group or what anatomical type is presented on the left of the figure, followed by the odds ratio and confidence interval on the right. And then we have a graph um, showing each odds ratio and its confidence interval in the center. So again, for those of you who work with odds ratios regularly, you may know exactly what these numbers represent and what the scale and the legend mean. Whereas for others of you who aren't so familiar, this figure might be quite confusing. This is an example of how someone has redesigned a graph with odds ratios to make it easier for an audience to understand what exactly the graph is showing. And so there are a few things that have been done here. Um, the first thing is to provide a line at the uh, one marker and to clearly state what the comparison group represents. So here the comparison group is white um, compared to other ethnicities or races. And it's important to state first off that this, this graph is designed to show the, in, the risk of dying of, from COVID-19 for uh, individuals of other races compared to white individuals. Okay, so we start off with our line um, at the, one, the odds ratio of one. And instead of saying that there's an odds ratio of one, the authors have noted that this is just as likely. Um, so they provided some orientation to what that label actually means. And they've told us what the comparison group is. They next tell us that anything to the right of the just as likely line is an increased risk of dying from COVID-19. So we can see that in most cases, the risk of dying from COVID-19 is increased compared to white individuals. They've provided the odds ratios and confidence intervals for each group, and then they've adjusted the labeling on the axes. So we have just as likely, one and a half times as likely, and two times as likely. And this might be clearer to you if you are not used to working with odds ratios compared to 1, 1.5, and 2. And then I just have included a second version of the figure below to make it easier for you to see the entire thing without the distinguishing features marked. Okay, one of the things that you want to do when you're planning your paper before you start writing is to identify the most technically challenging concepts for your audience and create visualizations. So we've often heard the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. Having a well-designed visualization can save you a lot of paragraphs of explaining a complicated concept to your reader and help you get the message across more efficiently and rapidly. So there are three steps that you want to follow when you're designing a figure. The first thing you want to do is to define the objective of your figure. So you need to decide what research question your figure will answer, and then you ideally want to make sure that all elements within that figure should answer a single research question. This is not always possible in part due to page limits on or to limits on the number of figures that you can have in a publication for particular journals. However, when you can do this, it's best that all elements in a figure answer a single research question. The next thing that you're going to do is organize and plan your figure using a figure planning table. And the third thing that you want to do is organize your panels using a figure layout sketch. And I'll show you what this process looks like with a small example. Okay, 
so we said the first step was to define the objective of our figure. So let's say that I've done an experiment and the objective of my figure is to illustrate the effects of an animal model and an experimental treatment on pup and placental phenotype in rats. The next step is to set up a finger planning table. So here I'm going to outline each of the panels that are in my figure, the objective for the panel and the visualizations that I want to use for that panel, the experimental groups, and then any notes about important features to consider when I'm creating that image or that part of the figure. So here I decide that to answer my research question, I'm going to have three panels, A, B, and C. The objective of the first panel is to illustrate differences in pup phenotype. I'll do this using both a photograph of pups from each group as well as a chart showing data. And then I'm going to have four different groups, control group that received placebo, experimental group that received placebo, control group that received treatment, and an experimental group that received the treatment. And then I also have some notes here. Um, so for example, I might note that I want a photograph with a scale bar when I'm visualizing pup phenotype and that I want to use a box plot to display data for fetal weight. My second panel is going to illustrate differences in placental phenotype. And here again, I'm going to have a photograph and a chart with similar groups and notes to the panel above. And then for panel C, perhaps I want to illustrate histological differences in placenta, for example, staining for two different markers. Here, I'm going to have a microscope image uh, or a microphotograph, the same groups as before, and I'm going to want one image per group with separate rows for each of my two biomarkers. Our next step is to prepare a figure layout sketch. So generally speaking, for most of us, our eyes travel either from left to right or from top to bottom. And so you want to clearly align your panels so that they follow the structure to help guide the eye through the figure. And you also want to make sure that you have nice white space between either your rows or your columns to help the eye follow that to structure and to clearly separate your rows, columns, and panels. So there are two different ways that I could lay out this figure. The first would be to do a layout in rows, and I might have panels A and B with the photograph and the dot plot or box plot next to each other. Um, and then the panel C with the two different biomarkers below. And I might have one row for biomarker one and a second row for biomarker two. If I were doing a layout in columns, I would just switch this up a little bit. So I might have panel A above panel B. And in both cases, I would have my photo and then my box plot. And for panel C, I might arrange my four groups in a square according to extral versus experimental and and then treatment versus placebo, and I would have one square for each of my two biomarkers. Okay, the next thing that's really important when you're creating figures is to learn to critique and to refine your figure. It's very rare that you're going to use the first figure that you create. You always want to look at it critically, share it with others, and get feedback in order to make sure that your figure is clear and understandable to someone else. I'll give you an example of how to do this, um, and this is a figure we'll talk about in a later section on bar graphs, but it's a figure targeting the, mis the misconception that one can still use bar graphs to display data if the data distribution is normal. And I won't get in too much into the meaning of this figure, but I will just quickly say we have a comparison of three different graphs here, a bar graph alone, a bar graph with a dot plot, and then a dot plot alone. Um, and this figure simply highlights that when I use a bar graph, I tend to have two possible regions of distortion. Um, well, the first and most important thing is I cannot see the dots themselves, the actual data that make up this bar graph. And so for my regions of distortion, I will often cut off the axis a little bit above the error bar for the top group. And this can lead to distortion of the reader's perception of the range of observed values because data points that are actually in my data set may be excluded from the y-axis. And we call this the zone of invisibility. And then in some cases, our graph actually, our data points actually start at or close to zero. 
But in other cases, the starting point for our graph may not be anywhere close to zero, and zero may in fact not be a value that's possible or biologically or physiologically meaningful. And so you, if you have a large zone of irrelevance around zero, or the large portion of your graph is taken up by this region around zero where there are no data points, then it can really compress your data points into the top of the graph so that it becomes difficult to see the data distribution. So these are two ways in which the bar graph can distort our perception of the range of observed values. Okay, so let's talk about some strategies that I use to critique and design this graph. So the first thing that you want to do is start with a clear message. Um, I like to target misconceptions that my readers might have directly. And this is particularly important when I'm making infographics as opposed to data figures. And then you want to test and revise your figure until it conveys a clear message. So a colleague of mine from Dresden likes to say that good visualizations are designed. They don't happen by accident. And this is from Helena Yambor. And so usually if I get pulled in to look at someone's visualization and I can't really figure out what it's designed to show or what's going on, I will ask the person who's showing me the figure what it's designed to show and they will often say, you know, well, I'm not really sure, you know, we were thinking about maybe showing something like this. Um, and I'll say, okay, well, I can tell that you're not really sure because your visualization doesn't really seem to have a clear concept and I, as the viewer, am not getting a clear message. So let's talk about ways to fix that. Okay, so start with a clear concept. For, so for this figure, I had three concepts that I wanted to show, and this is already quite a lot. It's easiest to design figures when you only have one or two main concepts. So the first thing I wanted to show is that bar graphs don't allow us to critically evaluate the data, in particular the data distribution, that they distort our perception of the range of observed values, and that they draw attention to unimportant aspects of the data. Specifically, they focus our attention on the height of the bar and not how the difference in means compares to the variability in the data. So I started off by making a quick sketch of what I thought this graph might look like. And this is just a little sketch that I did on a piece of paper with a pencil. Paper and pencil sketches are great. You can do them very quickly. You can modify them fast. Um, and it's a much more efficient way of getting a general design together than by trying to make your exact figure in great detail in PowerPoint or whatever software you're using and then adjusting everything many times. So I knew that I wanted to start off with a bar graph showing mean and standard error. I also wanted to have a bar graph with a dot plot and a dot plot, and all of those graphs were going to show the same data set. I knew that I would have a region at the top where there were data points, but the axis for the bar graph was cut off. And I also knew that I wanted a region at the bottom um, between zero and a particular value where there were no data points. So I started off by creating a data set and then creating this figure to go with that. And right away, you can see that there are a lot of problems with this figure. And the main problem that really should jump out at us is that there are too many irrelevant details. So there's a lot going on here and the eye doesn't know where to go. I can't tell what features are important to the message of the figure and what features are not. Now, in this case, I am creating an infographic designed to share a message about, um, you know, how to visualize data and why a certain type of visualization is appropriate or not appropriate. And so this is very different from if I were showing actual scientific data that someone would need to answer a research question. For this type of infographic that I'm making, because it's not actual scientific data, and it really doesn't matter what type of data or exactly what variable I'm working with for the message of my figure. I actually, the fact that I've shown the axis labels and all of the numbers on the axes is a problem. Um, because for this particular infographic, which again, doesn't matter what type of data we were using, the only thing that's relevant to our concept is that the bar graph y-axis starts at zero. So because I'm doing this for an infographic, I want to eliminate irrelevant details. Um, data set specifically isn't important here, and so I want to take out the axis labels and everything other than that label of the y-axis starting at zero. Um, 
So I did that, and this is the second version of the figure that I ended up with. So it's cleaner and there are fewer details to look at, but it's still not really conveying a clear message. And the next problem that's immediately obvious to us is that the use of color is distracting and uninformative. So we have this kind of flag effect of the blue, white, and red stripes going across the graph, and that draws our eye away from where we want the reviewer to focus. So color is called what's called a pre-attentive attribute, which means when it's there, your eye pays attention to it, whether it wants to or not. That's something that your brain is simply hardwired to notice and pay attention to. So we want to be very careful when we're using color, and instead of using it in this distracting way, I want to change the use of color to just highlight where our attention should be when examining this data, and our attention should be on the range of observed values. So this is the third version of the figure. I've gotten rid of the red and blue stripes, and now I have a single long blue box going across the graph to highlight the range of observed values. And then I have labeled the range of observed values so I know what that blue box represents, and it's clear to everyone why I should be looking at that particular region. So we're now getting somewhere. This is a bit of an improvement. However, I have these regions of distortion that now are no longer labeled on the graph, um, which is a problem because those are crucial to my message. And so the next step is to add boxes to the bar graph to highlight these regions of distortion. So here's the fourth version. So now I have these two boxes. So I know that these regions are important for some reason, but I don't know why. And so obviously I need a simple and intuitive way of explaining what these boxes represent. So here I decided to create names for these two areas of distortion. And I called those the zone of invisibility and the zone of irrelevance. Now, if I were just designing a figure for a paper, I would add a title and a legend below. However, if I wanted to share this in a poster or a talk or on social media, then I might need some additional labeling around the figure to highlight the, the, uh, the main messages of the figure. And so here I've added some of that labeling. So I've added a topic to the top. So why shouldn't you use a bar graph of continuous, or even if you know that your data are normally distributed? And then I list the reasons below, that bar graphs don't allow you to critically evaluate continuous data, and that they arbitrarily assign importance to bar height rather than focusing on what we really want to know, which is the amount of overlap between groups, or how the difference in means compares to the variability in the data. So this is an example of how you can Start with a simple sketch um, and an objective and then go through various iterations until you get a figure that is understandable and rapidly interpretable to others and that is helping to convey the message that you wanted to convey. Okay, so when I'm doing these test versions, I will often get other people to look at and react to the figures so I get a sense of how they're interpreting. So I will often do visualizations of 10 to 30 seconds, depending on the complexity, and I'll just get someone who's walking by my desk um, to have a look at the figure. I'll show it to them for 10 to 30 seconds and then just ask them, what was the main message you got from this? And if the message aligns with what I was looking for, then that's good. And if it doesn't, then I have more work to do. I'll also sometimes do testing on Twitter um, just to gauge reactions from a broader spectrum of people. It can also be very helpful to ask a co-author or a colleague to check your calculations and summary statistics and visualizations or to recreate data figures in a different software. And this is just a double check to make sure that there are no errors in your visualization. And then lastly, you may want to consider depositing your visualizations in an online repository like Figshare or perhaps another repository that you're using to store data or code or protocols for your project. Um, in our case, we get a lot of requests to reuse visualizations, and so having those things publicly available, um, licensed under a Creative Commons license and in a place where everyone can access, makes it much easier for people who would like to reuse them to simply go and get the information they need without having to email me and wait for a reply. And it also saves me time finding the files and the information that they would need.
Some lessons learned for those of you who would like to try testing your visualizations on Twitter. Um, it's really helpful to always include your name and your Twitter handle on the visualization. So when I started doing this, I was just sharing visualizations from my account and I didn't have that many followers. So most people weren't really noticing that I was doing this. Um, and at some point I shared the visualization that I showed earlier with the zone of invisibility and the zone of irrelevance and that extended far beyond my network. And I immediately started getting, you know, um messages and comments from people of i want to reuse this where can i find it i've been through your papers i don't see this um you know where did you get this figure and so just including your name and your twitter handle as the source can be very helpful you want to be aware that others might save your visualization or contact you through twitter or through email to ask where they can find the original i've had both of these things happen I generally prefer to send this as a normal tweet and not state that it's a test visualization and simply see how people respond. However, there are certainly other ways of doing it. If I have two different versions of something, I often send the competing visualization separately and see which generates the most response, what type of questions each one generates, and that's helped me get a sense of which features are working and which version I might like better. And then I often revise or add figures based on the comments and questions that I receive. Some cautions. Twitter makes it easy to assess how your target audience should respond or could respond to your visualization, but you want to remember that scientists who are on Twitter are not representative of all scientists, so it's a population that skews younger, um, more towards male, and then certain areas of science are represented much more strongly than others. You want to be strategic about comments from individuals outside your audience. Um, sometimes you will get people from very different perspectives or fields commenting, and they may be far enough outside your audience that it's not as helpful to consider their feedback in the design of your figure. And then I like to use Twitter when I need something and not obsess over posting just for the sake of posting. Okay, let's talk about some other techniques you can use to visualize your data. Um, using emphasis and de-emphasis are helpful techniques to direct the reader's attention to what they should be looking at, as well as to avoid overplotting. Overplotting is when you have too much information on the same graph. So let's take a look at an example of this. So I have two different versions of the same graph. In the first version on the left, everything is emphasized. So the dots are black or the data points in the dot plot, the median lines are black and the axes are black. And presumably if they were shown the axis labels um, and the numbers would be as well. So everything is emphasized, everything is the same level and the reader doesn't know where to look. In the second version, I've used emphasis and de-emphasis. So the thing that I have emphasized is the median lines and those are in front in, in black. Um, and that means that when I look at this visualization, those are the things that jump out at me. And so I can immediately see that the third group seems to have values that are a bit higher than the other groups shown in this figure. And then I de-emphasize the dot plots, the data points, um, and the axes. So those are still there and I will see them when I go back and look at this figure again. So I get the first main message immediately, which is the third group might have higher values than the other group, but then I can go back and look at things like the sample size, the distribution of the data, the amount of overlap between groups, um, the scale and other features that I might want to know more about in order to fully interpret the figure. Here's a second of example of this, and this is a case where we're actually combining two different types of graphs, a box plot and a dot plot. Now, there are two ways to do this. I can either emphasize the dot plot by putting them in black, in, in the dots in black and in the foreground, and de-emphasize the box plot by putting it in gray and in the background. Or I can do the reverse. I can emphasize the, the box plot by putting it in black in the foreground and de-emphasize the dot plot by putting it in gray in the background. And then I have a third level of emphasis here, which is the median line, and that I've made in the foreground and in a color, red. So this is actually the most emphasized of any of the features on either of these two graphs. And we'll talk a little bit more in a later video about um, how to make effective alternatives to bar graphs for continuous data, about when you would use each of these techniques. But this just illustrates a way that when you're combining two different types of graphs, you can do it in a way that doesn't overwhelm the reader. <laughs>
by using emphasis and de-emphasis. Okay, um, there's a lot of information that I've discussed here. And so obviously I don't have time to go through everything that one might need to know. So there are a few resources that it might be helpful for you to consult later if you'd like more information on this topic. The first is a blog post from Helena Yambor on Better Figures for the Life Sciences. This will take you two to three minutes to read. It's very simple and does a nice job of outlining the steps of designing a figure. I would really encourage everyone to check that out. The second is uh, a paper that I mentioned about the importance of designing a figure for your audience and not for yourself. And so that comes from a paper called A Brief Guide to Designing Effective Figures for Scientific Papers, and I would really encourage everyone to look at that as well. And then lastly, there's also a video that I have created on why you need a communication and dissemination strategy for your paper and how to design one that works. So there is a YouTube video that's available if you would like to learn more about that. So that is the end of today's video, and I look forward to talking to everyone more in class and hearing your questions. Thanks very much.